The title of this morning's message, message is Priorities, Promises, and Persistence. This is what's all wrapped up in, in the Lord's Prayer. Do you ever feel as though your prayers go no further than the ceiling? Sunday morning in church, at least, our ceiling is a little higher than what it is at home. Or maybe you feel like your prayers just don't have any power. Not the way God says they should. Maybe you feel that when other people pray, their prayers are answered. And, and mine aren't. You're not alone. Even the disciples felt that same way. They asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. They weren't sure what to do, what to say. So Jesus gave them this example that we call the Lord's Prayer. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. There are some people that, that when they pray, it just sounds beautiful. They're wordsmiths. They know how to use words. They know how to put words together. People that, that pray like this all the time really listen. Now, not all of them, but a lot of times there's no substance to their prayers. It's just a lot of flowery words. They just sound good. They want the attention of, of people. And God says that that's all the reward they're going to get. If you stand up to pray in front of people so you get their attention, so they look at you and say, look at how good they can pray and how holy they are, God says that is all the reward that they're going to get. Which to me also indicates that their prayers probably won't be answered. Because they're not really praying to God. Verse 6 says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, it doesn't mean that the only place you can pray is in your closet with the door closed. There's nothing wrong with having a quiet place to pray. We need that at times. It helps to remove the distractions of the world. It helps you to concentrate on, on what you're praying about. It helps you to, to, to push out all those worldly thoughts that keep crowding out God. It does mean that we must put all of our attention on God and not on ourselves. It does not mean that we only pray privately and alone. We need those quiet times, but we also need times when we pray together as a body, corporately. But whether we pray alone or together, we all must look only to God at these times of prayer, not to be seen by those around us. Verse 7 says, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, because they think they will be heard because of the words of, because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. It's not the words that you say, it's not the amount of words that you say, it's not the words that you keep repeating over and over and over. It's not even the Lord's Prayer, reciting it over and over. Those things aren't necessary. God always answers your prayers, the prayers of His children. He does not have to answer the prayers of sinners, people that, that have not accepted Christ as their Savior. They're in a different book. But as his followers, as his children, God always answers our prayers. It just may not be the way that we think they should be answered. The answer is that we want. And God answers our prayers according to our faith. Now this can get us into problems because sometimes we think we have a lot of faith and we pray to God we want this great mighty thing to happen. But it's really not what he wants. And so we don't get that answer. And then we blame God. We accuse Him when it's really us that's in the wrong. Sometimes He'll give answers to those prayers. Even if it's not what He wants you to have. And He will teach you a lesson through that. 
Just make sure that when you pray, that you are praying because this is what you think Jesus would pray. That's what we mean when we get to the end of the prayer. We say, in Jesus' name, amen. For a lot of us, that's just putting the punctuation on the end and letting people know that we're done. But what that really means is that I think this is what Jesus would pray if he was standing here. See, God is our loving Heavenly Father. He knows all of our needs, even before we say them. He wants us to talk to him. As parents, we know what our children need. Sometimes we want them to ask us. Instead of just giving it to them, you keep giving your children what they need over and over without them realizing that they really, you know. By learning how to ask, we learn how to be thankful. And a lot of us don't know how to be thankful. Because we expect it. We demand it. God wants us to depend on Him just as our children depend on us. We are His children. And God is eager to give us everything we need. Not necessarily the things that you want, but the things that you need. In fact, Scripture says that He's able to give us even more than that. Even more than what we can even imagine. But one of the things we need to remember is that prayer is not our wish list. It is not our demand list. God is still God. He is sovereign. He is creator. He is almighty. We are his children. We need to ask, and always remember to ask, that his will be done. Not what we think we want done. He wants to give us unlimited spiritual blessings. And in our culture, we take that to mean he wants to give us all the things we need to make life comfortable. That's not true either. He will make life comfortable for us as long as that is what we need. In our Sunday school class, we've been talking about the deserts. These times that we have tried, these times of, of, of testing, they're not nice times most of the time. They're uncomfortable. But he goes through them with us because he's trying to teach us and in our life, we need times of hardship because he is trying to teach us. He'll give us times of great joy because even in that, he's teaching us. But quite often, I think we as Christians, we think all we have to do is pray to God and, and he takes away all these problems and, and if, if he doesn't take them away, then, then there must be something wrong with me. Well, there probably is something wrong with you. He's just trying to help you learn how to overcome that. But he never promised to take away all the thorns of life. But he did promise to go through all these trials and temptations with us. Because he's God, he knows what is best for us. Jesus went through this and in verse 9 he says, This then is how you should pray. See, there isn't anything magical in the Lord's Prayer. Reciting it over and over doesn't cause things to happen. You cannot make God do anything by saying certain words in a certain way like some people think. If we can make God do things, then he's no longer God. We are more powerful than he is. But anyway, he starts out. He says, our Father in heaven. Our prayers need to be addressed to our Heavenly Father. Not to an idol, or a spirit, or an angel, or even to the saints. It is to be addressed to God. The Father. We must come into his presence with reverence and awe, remembering who he is and the power he possesses. He is our Father in heaven. He is the creator of all that exists. Yes, he is our Father. But we need to also remember he is God, our Father. We need to come before him with an attitude of thanksgiving for all the blessings he gives us. We begin prayer with praise for his greatness and his glory. You know, read the Psalms, read the prayers that David prayed, and notice how many times he starts out with praise. It helps us to get our mind in the right position. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. May God be praised. To God be the glory. That's what that means. But how often do we pray 
or when do we pray, do we think only of our own needs? Maybe the needs of others, but nothing about who God is. We don't begin by praising God. You read through the Old Testament. Watch some of the old movies on TV when, when somebody would come into the presence of the king. What did they always do? They always buttered them up, if you want to look at it that way. They start out by praising him with all these things. Look at all the wealth you have. Look at how nice you are and how good you look and all the beautiful women you have in your hair and all this stuff. Sometimes I think God likes to hear that because it means we're paying attention. But it needs to come from the heart, not just trying to, trying to butter them up. Then we say, your kingdom come. So when Christ came the first time, he brought God's kingdom to earth. God's kingdom is present in everyone who believes in Christ. That is why Jesus, Yeshua, preached the kingdom of God is near. He was God. He brought the kingdom with him. When he said the kingdom of God is near, he meant it is right here beside you. Yet in another way, the kingdom of God is not fully here. It is not fully come. Satan still rules this earth. He is still called the prince of the world. There are still many people that are prisoners in Satan's kingdom of darkness. Because of that, we need to pray that God will come into the lives of more and more people. That more and more people might be delivered from Satan's kingdom into God's kingdom. And that is key. A lot of times people want to become a Christian. They want to escape hell, but that's all they want. Repentance is turning away from and to. You turn away from Satan and what he wants us to do and to God and what he wants us to do. There is a changed life. We also need to pray that God's kingdom will fully come. That Christ will return. And when he returns, he will destroy Satan and his kingdom. And when he returns, God's kingdom will be fully established both in heaven and on earth. Which leads us to the next part. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, when God says something, the angels do it. No questions. No hesitation. It's done. That's how he wants his will done here on earth. And wherever the kingdom of God is... His will is being fulfilled. We need to be praying constantly that God, that God's will might be fulfilled in our lives, in your life, each and every day. See, only then can His will be fulfilled on earth as it is in heaven. It starts with you. It starts with me. Each one of us is individuals. We can't pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven and then sit back and do nothing, expecting everybody else to do it. It will never get done that way. His will will never be done because you are not doing what he's called you to do. Now, after praising God, then we may bring in our petitions. Verses 11 through 13 talks about our needs. The need of our body, bread. For our soul, forgiveness. For our spirits, deliverance from the evil one. See, verse 11 says, Give us today our daily bread. This means give us day by day all the things we need for our body. Food, clothing, shelter, health. Day by day. It does not mean unnecessary luxuries or conveniences. Every day we are to completely rely on God, to be dependent on God. See, we could not live one day without His sustaining power. He could stop the rainfall. Our crops would be done. He can send storms, destroy our food. He can allow devastating sickness to run rampant over the earth. And people would focus on that and keep their eyes off of him. You know, what's, what's interesting, even atheists who say there is no God cannot live one day without him as the creator of the universe, as the one who holds it all together, 
as the one who cares for our daily needs. And then he says, and forgive us our debts. Now some translations say debts, some say sin, some say trespasses. It means all three of those things. Matthew uses the word debt because he considers sin a debt to God. In the original language in the book of Luke, he records this phrase, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. People are indebted to us because of the way they've treated us, the way they have sinned against us. You, the way you have sinned against someone else. But we start by asking him to forgive our debts, to forgive our sins. And the next line is, as we, as we also have forgiven our debtors, as we also have forgiven those who have sinned against us, as we also is key. It means in the same way. In the same way we forgive those who sin against us, please forgive me. This is what you're saying to God. In the same way that I forgive that person that called me a name, that person that cut me off in traffic, that person that has hurt me, in the same way that I forgive them, you forgive me. Which means what? Jesus was not talking here about our first forgiveness when we first come to him and ask him to forgive us and save us. He's talking about our daily living. If we stop forgiving others daily, God will stop forgiving us daily. This is what Jesus taught us to pray for. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Kind of hard to swallow. I don't want to agree with that, but that is what God, the Son, taught us. Forgiveness is like water that flows through a pipe. If it doesn't come out on the one end, it cannot enter on the other end. If we do not let the water of forgiveness flow to those around us, God's forgiveness cannot flow in. Verse 13 says, and lead us not into temptation. To lead into temptation means to be defeated by Satan, to fall into sin, to become separated from God. This word temptation is not the testing and the trials that Scripture talks about that does come our way, as in, as in chapter, or James chapter 1. Those are ordinary things that come into our way, these tests and trials. They're, they're sent our way, they're allowed to come our way in order to strengthen our faith, to help us grow as a Christian. In those things, we need to rejoice and be glad. Because they are coming to make us more like Christ. But in this verse, Jesus is teaching that, that we pray not to fall into that final temptation, that temptation that will pull us away from God. But then he also says, but deliver us from the evil one. We can pray that God will keep Satan away from us. There is nothing wrong with that. Well, that's being selfish, isn't it? We are to go through these things. We will be tempted. But that is not, God does not tempt us. He does test us. He does allow things to come our way to strengthen us. A totally different reason for those. Temptation comes to destroy you. And we can pray, deliver us from the evil one. And that must be our constant prayer. If we would remember to pray this day, our lives would be a lot less stressful. Satan goes around as a, as a, prowls around as a roaring lion. A long time ago I heard that, that, that the, the roaring lion is the male. But do you know who does the hunting? It's the lionesses. The male ro walks around roaring. I'm not sure the lioness can roar like the male can. Like the lion can. He prowls around looking for the weak ones and roaring, trying to intimidate them and to make them afraid so that they begin running and then the lionesses do the kill. Satan is the same way. He is prowling around, roaring, trying to scare us so that we will forget whose we are and we will turn around and run away instead of staying with God. Because as long as we're with God, Satan can't do anything to us. Except rock, prowl around him and try to scare us. 
Now, Matthew does not end with the words that we commonly uh, conclude the Lord's Prayer with. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Other uh, books do, but Matthew doesn't. But when you do include that, you begin with praise and you end with praise. Because God, yours, only yours is the kingdom. Only you have the power. And it is going to last forever and ever. Amen. Amen means so be it. Please let this happen. It's not necessarily a big punctuation mark at the end. But what you're saying when you say amen is that let this be so. It expresses our faith that God will accept and answer our prayer because this is what Jesus would pray. And again, since he is God, he will answer your prayer as he sees fit. Never forget to end your prayers with thy will be done, just as Christ did. Thy will be done. When he was in the garden, Jesus prayed, Father, if there's any other way, I don't want to go through what I'm going to have to go through, but not what I want, what you want. Amen. It doesn't record that amen, but that is what he was saying. Not what I want, but what you want. And then Jesus goes on. He, you know, he gives this, and then he goes back and he points a little something out here. Verse 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. We ignore that, those two verses. We don't like those two verses. But they're there. Jesus is re-emphasizing that point. And that little word, if, is such a powerful little word. Only if you forgive others will God forgive you. And if you don't, God will not forgive you. Then in Luke chapter 11, gives us a little more insight into this. Says, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I, I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one on the inside answers, Don't bother me. The door's already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Go to God and pray and ask him. And then Jesus gave this illustration that points that gives the point of the story. He says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. We like that verse. For everyone who seeks, who asks, receives, those who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. We like that. I like that. But it does have qualifications to it. We must be seeking and asking what God wants to have done in our life. We take it to mean I can go to God and ask Him for a brand new car every year. And He'll give it to me. That's not what it's saying. Then Jesus went on and He says, So I say to you, whoops, down for it. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If earthly fathers know how to give good gifts, do you not think that God, the Father, knows how to do so, and even better? And what better gift to give us than the Holy Spirit? Notice how he ends that. You know, if your son asks for a fish, you know, you give him a snake, or if he asks for an egg, you give him a scorpion. How much more will the Heavenly Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit? And see, that part's a lot of times overlooked. In our mind, we read that, but in our mind we're thinking, how much more is God going to give me because I am His child? But it says, how much more will the Father in Heaven give you the Holy Spirit when you ask Him? That is what we need as Christians. 
He is what we need in order to live our lives the way that God wants us to live. And all we have to do is ask. Now in our church here, we believe that the Holy Spirit is the indwelling of a person. And when he does, he gives, he gives you spiritual gifts. Now there are those that teach that the evidence of this being filled is speaking in tongues. We do not believe that here. It isn't one of the evidences. You want proof that your life has changed? You want proof that the Holy Spirit is in your life? Then you look at the fruit of the Spirit. You look at a changed life. Because I've seen many people who speak in tongues, but during the week, they live like hell. For lack of a better way to say it. Being filled with the Holy Spirit will change your life, not just on Sunday, but every day. And it becomes a life of being, not just doing. And in our church, in the Church of God and the Holiness Movement, we have the list of all the things we have to do and not do, and we're good at following this list. Those are the, that's the doing. We're not good at being. See, we can store it up here, but until it comes into the heart, until it becomes part of us, until we live that way automatically, football season's here again. I watched the Huskers yesterday. I can't live in Nebraska for 13 years and not follow the Huskers. And they won it. They won pretty good yesterday. You see good football players, and they automatically do what needs to be done. They don't have to stop and think, well, that guy's running here. And they just automatically respond. That's what this is talking about. Be. Now, if I play football, I have to stop and think. I'm the football doer. Not a football beater. I don't understand it that well. And that applies to anything. Any sport. Any job. You can get to the point where it becomes habitual. Now that creates its own problems too. We're not even going to go there. But the question I want us to answer. Is your life changing? Are you being? Or are you still doing I want you to take a few moments. Ask God to reveal to you the changes that you need to be making in your life today. We all need to be making changes. Every one of us. Because none of us are perfect yet. We will get that way when we get to heaven. But until we do, we have to keep changing. Becoming more and more like Christ. A life of being. Not just do it. Take a few moments. Think about that.